Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's Kenworth Northeast Training Academy. We appreciate you taking the time to hop on the call with our friends from Fleet Guard to learn more about coolant for your heavy duty engines. So my name is Melinda. I'm the Director of Marketing at Kenworth Northeast. You've likely received a few emails from me leading up to today's call. Uh, more importantly, we're joined by Jay Stevenson and Greg Hemmermill from Fleet Guard, and they'll be leading today's session. Matt will be, oh, sorry, Jay will be sharing a lot of great information, but if you have a question, um, you can submit it by clicking on the Q&A icon in your Zoom browser, and we'll answer the questions throughout the call or via a follow-up email. So today is our last Trading Academy session for 2023. We have started working on our schedule for next year and are excited that it will not only include a number of great um, product lines, but also opportunities for in-person certification trainings. So stay tuned for more information uh, to be posted on our website, and it'll also be available in your emails later this year. So with that, I will go ahead and pass it on over to Jay to take us through our training. Awesome. Thank you, Melinda. Let me share my screen. And then we'll get started here. All right. I'm assuming you can see this. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sure. See awesome. Perfect. Well, hey, thanks, guys. Really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to, to sign up for this session and be here and to join us as we talk a little bit about engine coolant and cooling system maintenance today. Uh, on behalf of Fleet Guard, definitely want to say thank you to Melinda and thank you to Kenworth Northeast for the opportunity to present some of this material. I'm uh, really excited. And I would encourage you guys, for, for those that are listening, uh, whether you're listening in real time or you're uh, listening to this after the fact since it's being recorded, uh, I'd encourage you, grab a pen, grab a piece of paper. We're going to be covering some really good information that I think will be useful to you, very practical things that you can take with you as you think about going and selecting engine coolant for your uh, vehicle and equipment applications, and as well as the way you go about maintaining those, which I, I think are going to, as you'll see, are equally important uh, to that purchase initial purchasing decision. Uh, for those that I have not met before, my name is Jay Stevenson. I'm the North America Training Leader for Atmos Filtration Technologies, former formerly Cummins Filtration, uh, but the Fleet Guard brand of products that you guys probably uh, are very familiar with that have been around the industry a long time. Uh, I've been with our business a little over 10 years now, and I'm based in the Nashville area. And I'm also joined by Greg Hammerly. He's one of our territory managers covering kind of the Northeast area here in the United States. And uh, Greg, has, he's been a territory manager with us for a little bit of time now, but he actually had been out West with us as well. So he's going to be around for helping with some of the questions and answers and probably interjecting a little bit of uh, his own kind of things he's seen. Uh, as as a field salesperson and uh, working with customers and actually being out and seeing a lot of this stuff uh, face to face. So uh, today, as you can see from our screen, really our, our topic and our focus of attention today is going to be on cooling system, uh, really just looking at engine coolants themselves. And then we're going to also look at cooling system maintenance. If I can get my slides to advance here. Okay, yeah, so in a little bit of engine coolant 101, so, you know, kind of what's in a coolant, what are things we should be looking for when we're going to select a coolant, you know, how are uh, coolants formulated, how do they work, we're going to talk a lot about those types of things, then we're going to talk about really the maintenance side of things, so how do we take care of these systems, you know, do coolants degrade over time, how should we be replenishing uh, the parts of them that do wear out over time, so that's going to be a little bit of our discussion today, and as Melinda said, you know, if you guys have questions, please Feel free to drop those in the chat window as we go along. And I'll I'll do my very best to try and answer those in real time, but uh, certainly we've got some time at the end we'll have for some Q&A as well. So function of engine coolant. As you think about engine coolants today and really what does an engine coolant do? You know, the name obviously kind of gives that away, whether you call it coolant or antifreeze. Uh, it's all about managing engine temperature. So as you think about uh, an engine, a combustion engine, it's producing a lot of heat. And that heat has to be managed in a way that's going to, you know, remove that heat from the system. So the engine uh, has durability and, and longevity. You know, if that engine just continually gets hotter and hotter, it's not going to last very long. So we've got to get that heat out of the system. And that's what your coolant's designed to do. So it's going to design, it's designed, you know, first and foremost, first and foremost to keep that engine 
cool as the as it runs and gets uh, hot uh, heat built up in it, but also at those you know freezing temperatures, it's designed to keep that engine from freezing up as well. So what's in a coolant? If you want to think about coolant in the simplest terms, it's kind of like you know maybe when you were a kid you used to you know bake cakes with your with your mom or your grandmother maybe you baked, made cookies at some point in your life or brownies you know you have basic ingredients that go into making uh you know a, a sheet of cookies um you've got milk you've got flour and sugar and, and those types of things much of what we're looking at on the screen here and you have to have each of those things and you have to have them in the right amount in order for that cookie or that cake to end up being what it is and and also tasting good well coolant's no different you, and really you've got three basic ingredients again as you think very broadly across engine coolants you got about three basic ingredients that go into these products the first ingredient is water and water is used because it's very good at conducting heat on its own so it's good at absorbing heat up to a certain point and obviously as we said that's kind of the point of this uh you know, the point of coolant in the cooling systems, we're trying to absorb that heat and remove that heat from the system. So it's really good at doing that on its own. And that's why it's used. But one of the main things you want to think about as you think about water as a component to your coolant is that water quality has a significant impact on the performance and life of that coolant product. Um, so out in the marketplace today, you can buy coolant either in uh, pre-mix form or ready to use. Often it's uh, it's written on the label of the product. And that means the water is already in the product. So it's already dis formulated in a way that it's basically just ready to pour in the cooling system and you're ready to go. You can also buy coolant and concentrate. And that simply means it doesn't have the water content. So you need to add water and, and mix it up in that solution before you'd want to put it into a cooling system. There's a lot of folks out there that prefer buying concentrate because they're looking at the, the cost of the product and uh, hey, why am I paying, you know, all this money for premix and, and a drum or a tote when in reality a bunch of that is water? And I, I've got water handy; I can mix it myself. Well, that's great. You know, we obviously, you know, as an industry, sell concentrate coolant because that's an option. We want to provide that to people so they can mix their own water. If you are doing that, or you have customers that are doing that, it's really important to note that that water quality makes or can make a significant difference, just because the water quality is good enough for you to drink does not necessarily mean it's going to have a favorable chemical reaction when you go to mix it with that concentrate uh, product. So typically what we recommend is using a distilled water source or deionized or reverse osmosis treated water. You know, these are going to be water sources that don't have all the chemical impurities. Uh, you think about, um, you know, hard water. Like I said, I live in Nashville, middle Tennessee. We've got a lot of limestone in the ground. So hard water is something we deal with here. You think about scale buildup that happens around, you know, your sink or bathtub, that kind of thing. Essentially, that same kind of thing can happen inside the cooling system. So water quality is a significant thing that you want to think about as that one of those three ingredients. Our second ingredient is the base. So really, if, as you think about this, we're taking water, we're going to add another ingredient to it with the base uh, chemical. And that base is really essentially raising the boiling point of that water and it's going to lower the freeze point. So we're essentially just extending the thermal limits of that coolant. We want that coolant to have as much range as possible because obviously it's going to get hotter probably than what water is going to handle in a cooling system. You could also see much colder than what water can handle in a freezing situation too. So I think one of our teaser questions there at the beginning was around, you know, what's the most common base used in a coolant today? It's actually ethylene glycol. I think I saw the votes come in for, for propylene, but it's actually ethylene, so EG coolant. If you've ever been looking at the uh, safety data sheet or a label of a coolant product and you see where it says uh, the product's name and it says it's a PG or an EG, this is what we're talking about. It's talking about the type of base being used in the product. EG is the most common. Uh, it's ch a cheaper ingredient to use. Uh, that's one of the reasons. And it really is the best for freeze protection. So if you're in a you know cold weather climate, obviously I'm talking to a, a group of folks kind of in the Northeast uh, where you see cold winter weather, uh, EG is really the product you want to be using. It, it is toxic. So that's kind of the downside. <laughs> you know, you don't want to uh, add this to your drink or anything like that, right? It is a toxic chemical, but it's great for freeze protection. Propylene glycol is kind of the other 
product that you will see in the marketplace from time to time. And it's it's a little less common. Um, it's typically more expensive as a commodity than that ethylene glycol, um, but it's non-toxic. So the reason you might use this product is if you had certain uh, requirements for um you know, chemical storage or, or spills, uh, spill control, report, uh, you know, kind of reportable incidents. You know, if you had a spill incident or something like that, I know some mine sites uh, carry PG coolant because they don't have to report it if they have a spill. Um, that's one of the reasons you'd see propylene glycol being used. It's not quite as suitable for cold weather conditions. So again, if you are in a place where there's extreme cold weather, you know, this is not the ideal product you'd want to use. Hey, Jan, you mind if I just interject here for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, another reason that you'd use propylene glycol instead of ethylene glycol um, is for based, based around foods. A lot of food carriers are using propylene glycol uh, just for that non-toxic factor. If they do have any spills, they want to make sure that, you know, they're not contaminating their food. So a lot of food carriers are going to be using propylene glycol instead of ethylene. Yeah. Hey, that's another great example, right? Real world practical reason why somebody might be using that PG product versus an EG. So yeah, good, good point, Greg. So we've got water, we've got base, and then really our third ingredient is the additive package. So, you know, the additive package is really designed to provide that chemical protective quality to the coolant. So the first two things, you know, water and the base, that's really designed for the, the temperature management side of the coolant. The additive package, this is providing the chemical protective uh, element to that coolant product. And we're going to see some examples of what it's designed to protect against, but there's lots of things that can happen uh, in that cooling system. And, and these additives are designed to really put all those things at bay. So if we kind of look at some, you know, this is some ex kind of functions of your additives, right? What are some of the things your additives are designed to do in that coolant product? Um, if you're looking at the screen, you know, you probably haven't seen something like this maybe since your high school chemistry days, but this is the pH scale. And uh, really, if you look on this scale, you know, everything kind of down towards zero is more acidic and things up towards the right are more alkaline or more basic. And your coolant product, a new coolant should be sort of closer to that middle range, right? Kind of that eight, nine, 10, you know, range on the scale. So a little bit more above water, kind of around that, around that baking soda uh, baking soda level of pH. Now, again, pH is something that can change based on, you know, the way these chemicals are interacting or the way you're maintaining that system. And one point I want to make here is, you know, how would we know what level, what the pH level is of our coolant, it, um, you know, as, as time goes along? Well, really testing and maintenance, this, that's the only way to know what's happening in the cooling system. Unless you're having problems, you know, unless things are breaking, then it would be an indication of maybe what's happening. But if, you know, as that engine's just functioning, testing and maintenance is very important to understanding, hey, is my cooling system working the way it's supposed to? We'll get into that more in a little bit. One of those things that I mentioned, though, that can happen, these are kind of some fail points or, or things that, you know, can uh, happen as a result of the additives not performing the way they're supposed to. And one of those is scale. So scale buildup, as we mentioned, this can uh, often occur as a result of poor quality water being used uh, in the mixture of those products. Uh, but scale is a chemical buildup that will occur on you know, parts of the cooling system or power cylinder components. And effectively, the reason it's a problem is it basically acts like a thermal insulator. So just like you hold a hot cup of coffee in your hand inside that uh, styrofoam cup, and you're able to hold it because it's being insulated, that's what scale is doing to the engine. So the whole point we said of the cooling system is we're trying to get that heat out of the cooling system. Well, if you've got scale building up on various parts of that cooling system, now that heat's trapped. That heat that we've been trying to get out, it's trapped and it's stuck in the system. And you know the tough part of scale is you don't usually know there's an issue until stuff starts breaking because uh, you, know, you can actually, obviously power cylinder components can get damaged here, but you could even crack a block, you know, because things get hot enough and they expand. And that's where you start, you know, seeing problems. So your additives should protect against this. Uh, but this is something that can happen if you're using a poor quality coolant. Cavitation and erosion. Uh, these are pictures of water pump impellers. And you'll notice all those little bites and chunks that are taking out. And what happens in that system as the coolant circulates through the cooling system that system's under enough pressure, you have little vapor bubbles that form in that system. And those little vapor bubbles form and they burst 
And when they burst, they're under enough pressure, they'll actually take little bites and little chunks, and it's basically pitting through those metal components. So if you have ever had an instance where you're going through water pumps or you went through a water pump uh, much sooner than you should have, you know, we, we've seen fleets where they're changing these fairly often, almost treating it like it's a routine service item. Uh, that's not supposed to be happening, folks. Uh, that would be an indication, hey, your coolant is not providing the level of protection it should. That additive package is not doing its job. So if, if you ever see that, that should be a red flag to you. Something similar is liner pitting. So, you know, with heavy duty diesel engines, you have these cylinder liners and uh, in a similar fashion, you oftentimes as a result of kind of the vibration that happens from combustion, you'll see these bubbles form and actually burst on the side of those cylinder liners. And again, it's under enough pressure that those little bubbles when they burst or when they pop, they'll actually take little bites and little chunks out of that cylinder liner. And if that goes on long enough, just like the pictures you're seeing on the screen, it'll eat right through uh, that metal. And then that's when you have, you know, loss of compression. You've got lots of uh, chemical, you know, for, you've got fluids and things that are mixing that shouldn't be mixing. So, uh, again, that could be an indication that there's problems. Uh, your additives are not providing the right level of protection. So these additives we keep talking about, right, that third ingredient, they are designed to be used up. So just like the additives in your lube oil, your, your oil that's running through the engine, you know, there's an additive package in your oil as well. You know, over time, that stuff wears out and degrades. And it's the same thing with coolant. So coolant does have a useful life. Those additives will get used up as they're interacting. And uh, you can obviously in the marketplace buy replacement additives, these supplemental coolant additives or SCAs as they're often called. Um, these are basically concentrated additives that you can put back in the cooling system to essentially kind of recharge that coolant product. But a question I'd have is, how do you know how many to add back in the system? So this is another thing where, you know, if, again, if you're not informed or, you know, no one really showed you how to do the right thing, uh, you could do more harm than good by just saying, oh, well, I, I guess I should put some additives in. So I'm going to add some more to the system. You can, act, you can actually put too many additives back in the system. So this is something that often happens uh, when there's an excess of additives in the cooling system, and this is called silicate gelling. And basically like that picture of the water filter on the left or that coolant filter, it's all gunked up with this kind of goopy jelly material. And essentially what's happening is we've got too many additives in the system and it cannot, uh, it's no longer soluble, right? So when, when I say soluble, we're talking about you going as a kid, maybe in, uh, you know, mixing a pitcher of, of lemonade and you pour all that sugar in, you can only put so much sugar in that water before, you know, it no longer dissolves in the liquid. And now you just have sugar kind of clumping up in the bottom of the pitcher. That's basically what's happening with these additives. You're putting so many additives back in that the additives, there's just so many in the system. They just eventually start clogging things up. And they'll actually create this gelatin uh, that forms in the cooling system. So this can plug up the water filter. I've seen it plug up radiators before. So um, it is important to understand when it's appropriate to put additives back in and how many to put back in. And we'll look at that towards the end. Okay. And I'm just going to jump in real quick. A lot, yeah, of, that, please. A lot, a lot of that happens uh, dependent on what you're using. I know there's coolant additives and filters. And if you're not aware that you have your additives into your filters, as well as, you know, adding those SCAs, uh, the liquid SCAs, um, that's when this really becomes a problem. I've seen that firsthand. So you got, you need to be aware of what you're using and putting on your equipment out there. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're, we're going to cover some of that too. So some things to kind of jot down as we're going along, but it's a great point, Greg. All right, so one of the questions we get a lot of times, and you know, you may have had this question before or had customers with these questions, but what about color? What about coolant color? Um, you know, there's lots of questions out there about, hey, uh, you know, I've got, I've got a green, can I mix it with a red? Or I've got an orange, can I, can I use yellow or pink? Uh, I mean, there's basically a color for every color in the rainbow out there when it comes to coolant products, and. Unfortunately, the industry has not done the best job of making things easier for folks. Uh, but ultimately, what you need to know is color doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it's not standardized across the industry. 
and different coolant manufacturers use different colors for different coolant formulations and technologies. So where you might have some consistency across a type of coolant with a certain color, it by no means uh, does that mean that, you know, just because I know most people using an oat technology have red, that doesn't mean that everybody's oat technology is red. Um, this is just kind of a snapshot of what you're seeing on the screen here. But as you think about type and technologies and color, just remember color is not something you'd want to be making decisions. You don't, you never want to make a purchase decision with coolant based on color. Um, I, I know people get really hung up on that, but you got to trust us. Color is not something that is going to be help you make a good decision. You want to, as the bottom states there, you really want to look at the label and understand what type of product it is and understand, you know, is this going to meet st industry standards? Is this going to meet a product that meets the formulation of what the OEM recommends? You know, we're going to look at some of those things next, but it's really important. You know, I don't know how to emphasize this. Tell all your friends, tell your customers, tell the people you work with. Col color doesn't mean anything. Uh, I don't know how I can restate that. Here's a and snapshot. I this is, yeah, go ahead, Greg. And I have actually, out in the field, I've seen coolant that's been clear with no color. So just, you know, another point to drive this home is that it's just a color dye uh, that they put in there to make you feel like you're using a red or a blue um, and differentiate against different liquids that you're putting into your truck. So I've seen, you know, a mix and a skew of all different colors just out there. Um, and as Jay is saying, that does not, it does not uh, lead to what, what type of technology is in the coolant. Yeah, I mean... If you want to say, hey, there's really four ingredients, you know, that fourth ingredient is a dye. I mean, it's a it's it's food coloring, right? It's a dye that goes in to give it a, a color. Uh, so it's kind of marketable and you can kind of differentiate between, you know, a lineup of coolants of whose product is what. Right. But that's that's really about all. It has nothing to do with performance from that standpoint. This is just another kind of look at this. This is actually from a, a uh, alliance brochure that I had from one of the trade show things we go to. And, you know, again, just kind of giving you a snapshot as you look there across the market and all sorts of different brands and types of coolant and the different colors that you're going to run into based on, you know, the different technologies and names and things like that. So again, just giving you an example here to think about, don't make a decision based on color. So some things you would want to look for, this is one of the things that you could look for to help you make a good decision. And one of those things is 2-ethylhexanoic acid or 2-EH. This is basically just an organic uh, ingredient uh, that's you know uh, an additive ingredient you'll see in some coolant formulations still out in the marketplace. And you know the, the issue with 2-EH is that it's very aggressive on elastomer materials. So when you think about an elastomer, you know, really what we're talking about is like silicone. So silicone, head gaskets, hoses, seals, you know, things that have an important part of the performance and life of an engine. And so what it does is it basically causes those things, those materials that should be flexible and, and bendable uh, to lose that flexibility. And they actually kind of shrivel up and shrink up. And so what you'll see oftentimes with this are, you know, head gasket failures. You'll see hoses develop cracks and kind of crumble away. Um, obviously, things that are, are problems. So if you've ever experienced that or, you you know, again, you're helping maintain a fleet or you've got uh, customers that are having this issue, you know, it'd be a good idea to go look at that uh, ingredient list, either on the safety data sheet or the label. And oftentimes you'll see it listed right there, just like people kind of look at the ingredients of food more nowadays. You'll see that 2-ethylhexanoate or 2-ethylhexanoic, like you see over there on the right, and it's listed right there. You might be wondering, well, why would people, you know, why would they still be formulating coolants using this if it's a known issue? It's a cheap ingredient. I mean, it's a cheap ingredient that helps, you know, a company be profitable or, you know, uh, not having to go and reformulate with something different. This is stuff that's been out there a long time. So it is still a problem. It's still an issue. We still run into a lot of customers that have coolant like this that are having cooling system problems and it's something you can kind of check away or put on your list there as a you know red flag thing to watch for recycled coolant this is another thing we still see this pretty prevalently across the united states and oftentimes these recycled products are offered as a low cost offering right so somebody walks in the shop and they say hey you know i've got this coolant product it's great it um you know it's as good as anything else out there. And oh, by the way, here, I can get it for you, you know, 
five dollars a gallon or something like that, right? Um, like most things in life, guys, if the price is too good to be true, it probably is. Just like I've got on the screen there, you're gonna get what you pay for. Most of what we see out there in the marketplace, uh, you know, these are some brands that we've run into, but there's a lot of other kind of small operations that are that are out there selling recycled product. Um, it's it's a very unfortunate situation because oftentimes people don't even they, they really don't have an understanding of why the product is bad. Uh, they don't understand uh, that there actually is no governing body or industry standard for recycled coolants out there. There is a legitimate way to recycle coolant, but most of the stuff that's out there it has not gone through that legitimate process. And so a lot of what's out there is basically uh, it's basically been filtered and uh, kind of re uh, I guess if you want to say they've uh, kind of, added the coloring and stuff back in, but it's, it's basically a little more than colored water. Um, so it's, it's kind of a problem. Um, again, if you've got customers using this stuff or if you guys have been using this stuff, there's a good chance you probably have seen a lot of component failures. And so, you know, we definitely would encourage you, even if you don't end up using a fleet guard coolant, you really want to stay away from recycled products. Um, it, it's one of those situations you're probably going to cause more harm than good with recycling. And a good way just to see if you do have recycled products, a lot of signs that lead to it is that uh, it will not tell you what type of coolant is in, you know, the jug or in your 55 gallon drum. Um, and even more recently, I've been seeing a lot of, you know, labels that just don't say anything of about the coolant or what's going to be in it or mileage or any safety data sheets. So just keeping an eye out on what, you know, what's in the shop or what's in your shop and what's on those labels and asking for safe, safety data sheets to, you know, kind of verify what type of coolant you're using. Yeah, absolutely. And as we said, looking at the label, one, one of the things we're going to look at here are some of these classifications. Um, so as you think about some, you know, whether it's recycled product or any of the products that are out there in the marketplace, you know, you can break all these down into kind of two buckets. Uh, you can break them down either by performance, which this is where you get into those industry specifications or, or even stricter are those OEM specifications that the manufacturer, the engine manufacturer sets. So you can look at it by, by performance or you can look at it by type. And we're going to kind of break those apart here now. So as you think about performance, really the number that you want to pay attention to is the industry standard for a heavy duty engine coolant. I think this was one, maybe one of our questions, um, or I'm thinking maybe it wasn't now, but uh, this is the number you want to pay attention to. So that number right there in the middle, ASTM D6210, this is the number you should be looking for on any heavy duty engine coolant product that you were looking at purchasing and using in a heavy duty diesel engine. So like to Greg's point, if you're looking at, you know, safety data sheet, or you're looking at the jug, or you're looking at the label on the, on the drum or the tote, if you don't see ASTM D6210 anywhere on that jug or, or on that product label, that should be a concern to you. That should be a red flag. If you are intending on putting that coolant product in a heavy-duty diesel engine and you do not see the industry spec listed anywhere there, that D6210 number, that's telling me, hey, this product was not tested against that industry standard. I really have no idea if this product's going to perform well or not. That number that's listed above, that D3306, this is your light duty spec. So for, you know, gasoline engines, passenger car, you know, light automotive application. You know, if you walk into an O'Reilly Auto Parts, most of the, or Advanced Auto, AutoZone, you know, most of the stuff that's going to be on the shelf in there is only going to meet that D3306 spec. So we want to pay attention to D6210. That's a good thing to write down. Now, usually more strict than that industry standard is that OEM specification. So this is where every engine manufacturer is going to have kind of their own spec because, you know, an engine, just like the human body is basically a big science experiment. You've got all these different materials, different uh, operating temperatures, and it all is chemically interacting. And so, you know, an, an engine OEM is not just doing that for fun. They want to make sure that the formulation of the product that's going in that cooling system is going to react favorably in that system. So usually, you know, that ASTM D6210, the industry spec, that's kind of the bare minimum that, yes, this will protect against specific things to heavy-duty diesel engines like liner pitting and scaling, but that OEM spec is going to raise the bar even more. And it's going to say, hey, not only is it going to do that stuff, this is going to also work favorably in the engine that you're putting it into. 
So something else that we we see kind of along those lines, there's another industry spec out there. And this is one you can kind of watch for because there's still a lot of this in the industry as well. This ASTM D4985. And this is kind of the old school heavy duty engine cooling out in the marketplace. And when you think about the olden days and the way that they used to make heavy duty engine coolants, was you basically took a light duty automotive coolant and you added supplemental coolant additives. Like we said earlier, those, those chemical additives you can put in the system. You basically were taking a car, an, a car engine coolant and adding SCAs to it to charge it into a heavy duty coolant. Um, this stuff still exists out there. You know, we probably have some, some old timers that have you know been around a long time back when this was kind of the only way to do it. And they've just kind of continued doing that or maybe trained other people. Hey, this is what we use. Um, it's still obviously kind of the low cost option out there. I mean, this is the kind of the cheap stuff out there. Uh, but the problem with it is oftentimes these are marketed as a heavy duty engine coolant. It'll say that on the front of the label. And then when you go read the fine print, you read the asterisk down there in the bottom right of the uh, screen, it's mentioning, hey, for heavy duty applications, the use of supplemental coolant additives is required. And so again, it's telling us what we have to do here is we, you've got to add SCAs to this to make it into that heavy duty product. So a lot of folks just see heavy duty on the label, they grab it, they pour it in the system, and then they go off to the races, not realizing, you know, they, they think they're getting heavy duty protection when in reality, they're getting light duty protection. Um, so you want to pay attention to that. You know, if you see that 4985 on the label, but you don't see D6210 anywhere, again, that should be something to look for that should be kind of a red flag that hey this might not be the best stuff for my heavy duty diesel engine and i've seen this sold as an all makes product um and you know it is an all makes product but you just need to make sure that you're adding your scas and dcas or your additive to make sure it's a heavy duty coolant and you know that sometimes will get left out or if somebody changes hands in a shop you know that information doesn't get transferred so this is just a good good watch out yeah absolutely and and at the end of the day right OEMs have moved on past this stuff. I mean, cause it's, yeah. W will it probably do okay? Like, yeah, it probably will do, do all right if you're managing it appropriately, but it's really not the preferred formulation. This is, you know, the industry's moved well beyond this to much better technologies, which we're going to look at next. And it's going to be mainly an aftermarket type of uh, situation that's selling that cool. Yes, def definitely. So types. So we just talked about you know, by kind of performance, you know, looking at specs and things like that. Let's just talk about broad types. So when you think about kind of these names you see out in the marketplace, these are the names you're going to typically kind of hear or see. You've got kind of conventional or legacy coolants that are out there. And again, you know, that I would think what we just talked about with those kind of universal heavy duty coolants, that's kind of probably going to fall in that conventional category. These are typically low cost, but you really have to babysit them a lot and really, you know, if you want to keep them running the way they're supposed to, a lot of maintenance, that sort of thing. Uh, it's then a pretty significant jump up to a hybrid coolant or a hybrid oat. Sometimes you'll see them referred to. Um, it's kind of taking some of the good things of a conventional coolant or a legacy coolant and kind of mixing with some of the good things out of an oat product. And so it kind of fits in that middle range, uh, but you will have, you know, longer service intervals, um, in terms of maintenance, not quite as, as much going on there than as the conventional stuff. But then really where the industry's moved to are these organic additive or organic acid technology coolants. I think that was one of the, the questions we had in the teaser at the beginning. So these are kind of the newest, latest, greatest things. I mean, the industry has been using them now for probably 10 years, but um, this is really the standard out there. And most, uh, most OEMs are factory filling with this type of product. Uh, longest service intervals, you know, they're really designed to just take a lot of abuse and neglect. So realizing that, hey, people probably aren't on top of maintenance the way they should be. These products kind of handle that pretty well. And uh, typically, you know, you're going to see the best kind of pr protection chemically out of these as well. So from a fleet guard perspective, right, we have products across that entire lineup. So everything from a conventional coolant up through a hybrid, you know, uh, our, our Cummins blue, right? I know we said don't talk in terms of color, but oftentimes I've heard that kind of referred to as Cummins blue. That's our ES complete product there in the middle of the screen. And then we do have our organic acid technology coolants there with our NOAT, our nitrided oat coolant, and then our ES complete oat. 
we do just a quick shout out have now a thermal fluid for battery electric and fuel cell electric vehicles it's called guardian so um, just in the off chance i know that's still a pretty early developing technology but if you had that type of application we do actually have a thermal fluid for those situations as well so if we're looking at the bottom of the screen some things we talked about right our coolants are fully formulated, so that means you don't have to add SEAs to turn it into a heavy-duty coolant. It's ready to go out of the container. They do meet that industry standard for a heavy-duty coolant with D6210. Uh, from a Cummins perspective, the strictest standard they have out there is Cummins Engineering Standard or CES 14603. Our products meet that. And then also we have the Detroit spec out there for, for a lot of those Detroit engines uh, driving around. That's the spec that our product also meets as well. So I want to just give a quick shout out to our ES Complete Oat product. Um, this is a product we really like uh, uh, to talk about with our customers. We, we think in terms of the value that it provides, it's really uh, offering what we think is the best kind of full package out there. So this is an organic acid technology or organic additive technology. What we really like about this, you know, Greg mentioned all makes coolant. This really is an all makes product. Um, unlike kind of the the old school heavy duty coolant this is kind of the best of the best technology but the reason we like it and why we say that it's compatible for all makes and all models is it's very designed to be very compatible with aluminum so obviously big trucks have been moving towards lighter and lighter components you know trying to be more efficient and so you'll have a lot more aluminum in kind of the newer vehicles out there but you know that's what an automotive side uses you know a lot of aluminum so back in the day those heavy duty engine coolants weren't very compatible with aluminum and that was why you didn't really have a heavy duty coolant that you could use on passenger cars this stuff is great to use across the board so if you or you know your business or you know a fleet customer you have you know depending on your situation if you uh it's you know we know it's not uncommon for folks to carry multiple types of coolant in their shop to take care of everything from, you know, commercial vehicles to passenger cars to uh, pickup trucks all the way up to, you know, heavy equipment. And you're, you're carrying lots of different coolants. There, there's a lot of opportunity there for uh, things to maybe get, not get managed correctly. You know, somebody can make a mistake and put the wrong coolant in the wrong application and maybe cause a problem. This is one where you could basically consolidate all of that coolant inventory down into one product and you could put it in everything from, uh, you know, your grandma's Buick all the way up to a high horsepower engine, you know, on a mine site. So uh, that's what we really love about it. As you can see from the bottom of the screen, it is a million mile coolant designed to last life of the engine. And you do not have to use supplemental coolant additives or kind of any kind of extender on this product. It's simply a top off, you know, if you needed to top off the system, maybe uh, if it's, if the system is going through some coolant or you had a coolant leak, you know, it's essentially a top off product and go. Uh, you don't have to use chemical water filters. You don't have to use, uh, you know, add SCAs back in the system, all that stuff you can avoid simply by using this product. So for that reason, you know, we think it's, there's a lot of value here in terms of making life easy uh, and convenient and taking a lot of the confusion out of coolant. This is a great way to go. Okay, so I want to wrap up our time here quickly in the next few minutes, uh, kind of in the back half of the presentation, talking about testing and maintenance. So, you know, choosing the right coolant obviously is important, and there's things to look out for and avoid, uh, things to consider, but also the way you maintain those systems is going to have just as much uh, impact uh, as the purchasing decision. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the testing products that we have available, as well as the water filters or coolant filter filters. And then just a quick wrap up on some of the cleaning products that we have, you know, in the event you do have some sort of, some sort of contamination that you want to take care of. So we come back to our handy slide here with additives. And just like we said, right, you know, the only way to know really what's happening in the system is by testing, uh, using test strips or, or uh, getting samples and uh, having those tested so that you can understand, all right, what do I need to, you know, are things working the way they're supposed to? What do I need to do to, maybe correct an issue that's happening, testing and maintenance, super important. So as we said earlier, additives, these supplemental coolant additives, sometimes depending on what coolant product you're using, you may need to add these back in the system. So if you are using, uh, you know, if we kind of think back to our coolants, so if we're using, uh, you know, a conventional coolant or maybe a hybrid coolant, 
like, uh, you know, for our products, you know, we're talking about Fleet Cool is our, our kind of conventional product. Uh, Fleet Cool EX and ES Complete, those are our hybrid products. You know, these are products where you may have to add SCAs back in the system, uh, depending on how they've been depleted. And if you want to have a heads up on which of our products to use with which coolant, uh, kind of that little chart on the bottom right is going to describe that for you. So we have two different SCA products. We have DCA2 or Diesel Chemical Additive 2 and Diesel Chemical Additive 4. And if if you're using uh, Fleet Cool or Fleet Cool EX, you're going to want to use DCA2. That's going to be the uh, chemical additive that you'd want to add back in those systems. If you're using ES Complete or that Cummins Blue product we talked about, which is still very common out in the marketplace, that's when you'd want to use that DCA4 product. I'm not really going to go through the whole process of like how you would figure out how to put them back in the system. We have YouTube videos that do all that stuff for you. And I'll, I'll make a reference to those here in a second. So uh, if you've got questions on, you know, exactly how many units do I add back into my system, uh, the test strips and kind of going through those videos, that'll really kind of give you the explanation you need. So how often should I be testing my coolant, right? So you're saying, hey, Jay, you're saying you really should be testing and maintaining your coolant. Well, how often should I be doing that? Like I said, for conventional coolants, kind of those legacy coolants out in the marketplace, again, a lot of times those are green out there. Um, I know we said don't go by color alone, but a lot of times there's kind of these old green coolants. Um, really, I mean, you should be testing them every oil drain or at least annually. You know, so if it's a piece of equipment that's not moving all that often, um, you know, where you might only be checking on it once a year, you know, annually at least, but every oil drain, uh, if it's more often than that which obviously might not be that long. Uh, for hybrid coolants, you know, it's a pretty significant jump up. You know, we're saying around 150,000 miles uh, or about 4,000 hours if you've got an off-highway piece of equipment or again, annually, whichever comes first. And then as you can see here with those oat coolants or the nitrated oat coolants, this is where, again, the technology is there for you to really go a lot longer. So, you know, 300,000 miles, we're going to double that uh, from the hybrid. Uh, or 6,000 hours off highway, or again, annually. So even from just a testing and maintenance perspective, you know, oat product, it's really designed to just kind of do its thing. You don't have to really go in and babysit too much. All right, so some of the testing products. This is a good one. Um, if you have a piece of equipment that, hey, I have no idea the last time this was tested, or maybe it was a, you know, a piece of equipment, a used piece of equipment you just bought or inherited or something like that. And you really don't know what kind of coolant you have in there. Obviously, the safest thing you can always do is just do a, a drain and replace. Um, so just drain the cooling system and put new coolant in. But you know, maybe you don't want to do that, or maybe that's not practical for you. That's where you can use these quick check test strips. And what I like about them is it's kind of the canary in the coal mine. So as you think about kind of how they used canaries back in the olden days to, to understand if there's a problem, this quick check test strip, uh, if you look at that pH strip, that pH strip is just a simple pass or no pass on where that pH level is. As you know, we looked at that pH scale a couple of times. And one of the things about pH is once pH gets out of balance, you really aren't in a salvageable situation. You're not going to be able to rein that pH back in. You actually are just in a drain and replace situation. So this is a great product to use just to understand, all right, what pH level are we dealing with? And if it's in the no pass range on either side of the spectrum, you really just need to flush that coolant out and replace it. So beyond, yeah, like I said, got a YouTube video in three minutes. It will show you exactly what you need to know there on how to use the quick check test strips. You also have the water check test strip. So again, this would be for the person that is buying concentrate coolant and mixing with their own water source. So again, in a simple no pass or pass situation, it's gonna look at hardness, it's gonna look at pH, and it's gonna look at chloride. And this is of the water itself. So not, not once you've mixed them together, just purely the water itself. So again, we got a two minute video. It walks you through exactly how to use that test strip with your water sample and what to look for. Uh, definitely check that out if you are mixing your own water in your uh, concentrate coolant. Testing and maintenance as far as the coolant samples themselves go. So this is where you have uh, any coolant that contains nitrite. So for our products, this is all of our coolants except ES Complete Oat, our OAT coolant, because even our 
NOAT or nitrated oat coolant has nitrite. Um, so these are going to, these three-way test strips, again, we've got a YouTube video. This is basically where you're going to dip that strip in. It's going to tell you based on the little color chart, how many units of those supplemental coolant additives you need to add back in the system. So that's going to give you your answer on how often should I be, uh, or, or how much should I add back in the system? This is your test to know that. Now, if you're using our ES Complete Oat, our organic acid technology coolant, we do have a separate test strip for that. This is the four-way test strip kit, and it's going to you know do the same thing we just looked at, except with the exception of you know we're not going to add supplemental coolant additives back in the system because these oat coolants you don't need to do that. So we're testing for pH. We're testing for some of the parameters there. Uh, but this is really where, you know, it's going to help us get an indication, you know, are, are we needing, are we low on coolant? Do we need to add more coolant back in the system? Or is there some other problem that's going on? And that YouTube video will walk you through kind of those steps and, and what are some watch outs there with our ES Complete Oat. For cold weather climate, I've been told this really is a must have item. These are refractometers. And if you don't know what a refractometer is, basically this is a instrument you can uh, drop your coolant sample in the little lens and you look through it like a pirate. And when you look through there, it's going to tell you what the freeze point protection is of the coolant. So when you get into those cold, extreme cold weather uh, situations, how well is that coolant going to protect uh, the system from freezing? And so there are a couple of different products there you can see on the screen. Uh, if you are using that ES Complete Oat coolant, that part number you want to pay attention to there is that CC8998 at the bottom of that chart. Um, and, and again, we've got a YouTube video. It walks you through exactly how to use a refractometer, what the little readout means, and um, kind of next steps once you've done that. So and I encourage you to check that out. Again, for you guys, it probably makes sense up in that cold weather region. And then lastly here, you know, we're right here at uh, water filters. You know, there's lots of different types out there. There are standard service, there's extended service, there's non-chemical, there's chemical. Um, you've got kind of cellulose or paper media, you've got synthetic media. So there's a lot of different types out there in the marketplace. But again, as Greg mentioned early on, if you are adding, uh, if you're using an ES Complete Oat coolant, right, you're using one of those organic acid technology coolants, you don't need to use supplemental coolant additives. So maybe you heard me talk about oat earlier and you're thinking, yeah, that'd be great. I really should use that. Uh, just be aware, you know, if that's if you've been running chemical filters, don't keep putting chemical filters on. You're going to want to switch back over to a non-chemical version of that filter, in which we do have, obviously, versions of all the different ones. So um, just something to pay attention to. Here's a good look at the guts of those chemical filters. So again, just like we had the discussion with the, the DCA2 and DCA4, same thing applies on the chemical filters. So if you're using Fleet Cool or Fleet Cool EX, you want to use DCA2 chemical filters. If you're using DCA4, you want to use, uh, or if you're using ES Complete, uh, the Cummins Blue Coolant, you want to use that DCA4 uh, chemical filter. And then finally, so the cooling system cleaning products. So let's say you do have a cooling system that is gunked up, maybe you screwed up and you, you've you got all that silicate gelling in the system, uh, in the radiator, all that sort of issue, and we want to clean all that stuff out. Well, we actually have some cleaning pro uh, products that will go through. You can kind of flush through those systems and get that stuff out of there. So if let's just say you know we've got uh, a soft contaminant like a silicate gel, or maybe we've got some sort of uh, you know oil or grease or fuel contaminant that got in the cooling system, that's when you want to use our Restore product. So the product there on the left side of the screen. And then if you've got really like abrasive types of contaminants in the system, so maybe some corrosion or scale formed in the system because we've used some low quality water, that's when you're going to use that Restore Plus product. Now, the only thing I want to make mention here of as you think about these cleaning products is they are active agent cleaning products. They are not designed to be left in the system for a long time. Our rule of thumb is two hours. So you're going to pour this in the cooling system, let it run for a couple of hours, and then you're going to flush this stuff back out of the system or drain it back out of the system. Uh, if you pour this stuff in on a Friday and leave leave work and come back on a Monday and it's still in there, you're going to have a big mess on your hands. You're going to have a, have a lot of problems. So uh, again, two hours, that's kind of our recommended limit here. 
Okay, so we talked about kind of coolant 101, some basic things to look for, stuff to watch out for. We talked about uh, the maintenance side of things and, you know, really best practices for going about maintaining those systems. I know we cover a lot of ground in a very short amount of time, um, and you probably have some questions or would like some more information. I encourage you guys to go check fleetguard.com. We have a ton of coolant information on fleetguard.com. Uh, as well as the YouTube channel. I know I mentioned that a few times, reference that. We've got probably more coolant information on our YouTube channel than we do filter information. So I would encourage you guys to go check that out. Um, use those resources, grab the links, pass those along, and uh, I think they'll be very beneficial to you.